I'm going to preach a sermon today which is simply titled, Hand It Over. Hand it over. So I want you to look at your neighbor and just tell them it's time for you to hand it over. Wherever you are, listen to me, wherever you are watching, I wish I could see you right now. Usually I can, but if I could see you, I want you to know that we love you, we're blessed to have you, and we know that God is doing great things in your life. I hope everything is okay wherever you are. Let me say that again. I hope everything is okay wherever you are, right? So we're going to go into the word today, which is entitled, Hand It Over. Chimps, you can park right there, and I'll come back and get you. Somebody commented last week that it's good to say you can park right there. Who was that? Who was that? You know, wherever. She's like, it's all right, golly, right? Anyway, let's get into the word. I have a word today, and, and I'll be very honest, it's a bit of a heavy word, all right? I, are you in the mood for a heavy word, all right? I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not sure I'm going to preach that much, but I think I have a heavy word, one that I tried to stay away from, but I felt that the Lord had placed on my heart. I believe that this is a word that is going to convict, I believe that this is a word that's going to transform, I believe that is a word that's going to reform you. If you believe it, say amen. 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 Uh, the other day I was on watching on Facebook, and I saw some guys in uh, South Africa, I believe, they are so sick and tired of 2020 that they decided to have an early new year, right? I saw some guys on their own. They had the countdown and works saying, five, four, three, two, happy new year, right? And they declared their own new year in 2020. I know many of us are frustrated with 2020 and we want the year to end because it's been such a challenging year. I already hear people saying that, I'm tired of 2020 already. Can 2021 come? But we said the same thing in 2019. We said, I'm tired of 2019. Can 2020 come? And then 2020 came, and it brought the same amount of frustration. The challenge with whatever year you go into is that you are going into it as well. I, I don't care what year you face, it will not change because you are going into it as well. Unless you change, the year won't change, Right? So it's very important that we understand this. And Mount Zion, this is so important. Us coming back, nothing has changed, right? We are still the same people unless we decide to be a different people. Unless we decide to be a people of difference and decide to be a people of distinct, distinction and decide to be a people of a standard of God. If you're with me, say amen, right? So I, I know this, and I know for many of us, the year has been so challenging and we want it to go away. But what if God has something significant planned for you in this year? Musa preached on it earlier this year, and he says, it's still valid. I don't care what has happened in 2020. The word of God is still valid, that this is the year of divine acceleration. Whether you believe it or not, God has declared it. God's word does not depend on your validation. God's word depends on his word. He validates it himself. So he himself has declared this is the year of divine acceleration. Whether you experience it or not, it's up to you to connect to that word. If you're with me, say amen. Uh, you, don't, you don't sound like you have faith today. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Listen to me. It's important that we know that 2020 is still a year filled with potential. And it's still a year filled with promise. And it's still a year filled with purpose. The challenge is many of us are experiencing tragedy in this time when we should be experiencing great potential. It kind of reminds me of the story of Saul. Saul was a guy filled with such great potential. Saul was picked as the king of Israel. He was apparently the most handsome. He was a tall guy. He had shoulders. He had everything about him. He was picked based on his appearance and people wanted a king, right? Be careful about picking things at face value. Can I preach today? Be careful about picking things at face value. Just because they look good doesn't mean they will survive. I'm telling you the truth. Have you ever bought something that looks good but doesn't survive? It passed the appearance test. But it did not pass the usability test. It did not pass the durability test. Right? Some of us have got devices, phones, shoes, things that looked nice but couldn't survive. Right? And, and the thing is, no matter how something looks, the equalizer and the true test is time. Give people enough time, they'll show themselves. I'm preaching today. Give, peop, 
give people enough time. That's why I don't understand people who say it was love at first sight. <laughs> give people enough time and they will show themselves. Okay, it could be love at first sight, but it could be crazy at second sight. Right? This is extremely important. So Saul seemed to be a guy who, who passed the test. Now, the thing of, 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 of the story in 1 Samuel, what you understand is the underlying story in 1 Samuel is to do with the presence of God, right? You find that in the story of 1 Samuel and mostly into 2 Samuel, there, there are main topics like the Ark of the Covenant, which is the presence of God, right? And also you find that the children of Israel look around and say, hey, everybody else has a king. Why don't we have a king? So they decide to choose a king. They force God. And God says, no problem. I'll give them their choice. I'll give them their choice, and they'll live with their choice, right? And, and we see that it's all about people taking the presence of God for granted and wanting what others wanted. So they chose Saul as their king, right? The people chose Saul as their king. Saul is a typical example of when God lets us have our way. I'm grateful that God has not let me have my way. Because it may have looked good at the beginning. I'm grateful that there are some jobs I didn't get. Because they look good at the beginning. I'm grateful there's some relationships. Oh, oh now, come on now. Right? Because they look good. And I always, I, I'm very concerned with the relationships of today. People get into it quickly and get out of it as quickly. Why? Because they're looking at how things look. And what you see about Saul is Saul had all the right appearances, potential, but always failed the critical tests. He, he failed the critical ones. You know, it was kind of like you wrote an exam, and they say, question one, compulsory. But Saul always missed question one. So no matter what he did, because he missed question one, the compulsory, he always failed. I, I know that some of us want to be like, that, that God, don't you see my effort? God is not looking for your effort. He's looking for your obedience. That's a lost word in this generation, obedience. Right? We've taken obedience as, as a cuss word. Right? But the Bible says if you're willing and obedient, you eat the best of the land. It so always failed the critical test. And every time he failed a critical test, there was a major struggle between Saul's ambition and God's agenda. That's what most of us struggle with. The struggle between our ambition and God's agenda. Truth be told, I think some people think they have higher standards than God. It's funny you say that before you look the other way and laugh at somebody else. How many times have we overlooked what God says, yet God says, my ways are higher than your ways? So when you overlook what God says, you're saying, my way is higher than his way. So ignoring what God says for your life is not just a casual thing. It's pride. If God says you are the head and not the tail, you say, no, me, I'm just like this. That is pride. I don't care what you call it. It is pride. Whether it is master's insecurity, it is pride. That's why the Bible says that we must bring down every thought, taking it captive. Every thought. And imagination that raises itself above Christ. Are you hearing that? How many thoughts do you allow that you place above the word of God? I'm preaching. I'm preaching. I told you today's a bit heavy. Today's a bit heavy. Because I want us to change. Look at your neighbor and tell them, hand it over. Come and look at them one more time and tell them, hand it over. Many of us think we have a better career plan than God does. Many of us think that we have a better business plan than God does. 
that God has, a, has an outdated. I hear people saying like the Bible is outdated. It is archaic. It needs to be developed. It needs to be new. New is for people who are bound by time. God is eternal. He's not bound by time. Are we together? So always failed the critical test because for him, it was always about his ambition and not God's agenda. I believe that's a big struggle for many of us, right? I mean, let me tell you the truth. The call of God will always challenge your ambition. <laughs> Listen, when God calls you, let's look at this way. When you get born again, what do you call it? To what? To repent. Isn't it? Okay, so let's, uh, let's assume. If you're going in this direction and you repent, what is that? A change in direction. So there's no way you can follow God and keep going the same direction. No way. There's no way you can follow God and keep going the same direction. Repentance is a completely different direction. God is not a peace. It's not a five-step career progression plan. Sometimes God will call you and change your direction completely. And you have to be humble enough. Am I preaching today? To humble enough to lay aside your ambition for his agenda. Because his way is always higher than our ways. If you're with me, say amen. Look at your neighbor and say, hand it over. God tells Saul to do a number of things. I need to be mindful of time. God tells Saul to do a number of things, right? And Saul decides to do his own thing. Why is this important? So God tells Samuel to tell Saul to do something, right? Okay, side note, for many of you, let me tell you something. Sometimes God may not speak to you directly. He'll use others to speak to you. And some of you don't know that you're failing the relational test. The issue that Saul had with Samuel was familiarity. Let me not go there. He was too familiar. He was too familiar that when Samuel said something, Saul said, I'll do it my way. He was too familiar. Sometimes we have to learn to, to discern. One thing I've learned in life is to discern, especially with my pastor and my reverend, when he's talking to me as a man and when he's talking to me as my reverend. You need to know and learn how to discern when God has sent people to speak to you. Sometimes God can use familiar people to give you another assignment. And here's the problem. Every time Samuel spoke, Saul took it for granted. And he missed it. God is very, very intrigued by the way we respond. Why? Write this down. My revelation of who God is, is seen in my response to what God says. Please write that down. My revelation of who God is is found in my response to what God says. Right? My revelation of who God is is found in my response to what God says. Okay? Let me say it this way. If, if God is a provider and he said he's a provider, then my response is to give and to tithe. Are we together? Uh, is somebody with me? Right? If God is a healer, then my response is to pray. Right? If God is a deliverer, then my response is to seek his deliverance. Are we together? So, your revelation is always what you recognize. And what you recognize is what you respond to. Is somebody with me? You always respond to what you recognize. Samuel understood the importance of response. Why? Because your response can keep you in the same place. I can prove it. Samuel, Samuel, right? He hears a voice. <laughs> 
and he goes to Eli. He responded to the wrong person. Twice he responded to a wrong person. Until Eli discerned, get that. Wasn't even Samuel. It was Eli who discerned that this must have been the Lord. And he taught Samuel how to respond correctly. He says, you hear that voice again. He says, here I am, Lord. Your servant is listening. Sometimes the role of the church is to teach you how to respond correctly. To respond in faith. To respond in belief. To respond knowing. How do you respond to what God has given you? How do you respond to your responsibility? How do you respond to your parents? Can I preach? How do you respond to your bosses? Praying for a promotion, but behaving demonic in the office. How do you respond? You see, many of us are entitled. Samuel, Saul is an example of an entitled guy. Felt, you know what? It must just work for me. I can do what I want and it will work my way. In this season, I believe that God is looking for humble people. People who are not going to behave in an entitled way, but trust him for what he does. If you believe it, say amen. Look at your neighbor and say, hand it over. You see, the challenge is that when God says something, we expect things to work our way. Right? Let's, let's be honest. When he said this is the year of divine acceleration, you already knew the way. In your own mind, you're like, okay, my finances. All right, here we go. Right? Accelerate my, accelerate this, accelerate that, accelerate. You see, nobody expects to go with God and expect things not to work. Nobody expects to jump in a boat with Jesus and walk into a storm. You're like, why is there a storm? You see, the issue is not the storm. The issue is your response to the storm. I'm reminded of a man by the name of Jonah. That when there was a storm, he was sleeping. He was sleeping. You see, it's not about the event. It's about the experience. It's not about what you, the event, it's how you experience it. Isn't it amazing that there were 12 spies that went? 10 said that the land is great, but we can't. Two, same place, different experience. Could it be that you can be in the same place and have a different experience? Depending on how you perceive that situation. Look at your neighbor one more time and tell them, hand it over. Right? Many of us, the time we were revealed, let me tell you the truth. It's easy to praise God when everything is going according to plan. It's easy. It's easy. It's easy to praise God. It's easy to serve when everything is going according to plan. It's easy. It's easy to be in a relationship when everything. Okay. Right? It's easy to have a wedding. It's hard to have a marriage. It's easy. Weddings are easy. Weddings are easy. I just love people. They, they, they get. Weddings are easy. I always tell people, in fact, if you don't have to invite me, don't invite me. All I'll do is eat your chicken. That's all. Right? Because many of us get frustrated and want to bail out on what God is doing because it's not going according to plan. Right? We think that favor is an exemption. Favor is not an exemption. Favor is an experience. <laughs> I'm preaching today. Favor. You see, when you're favored, you'll be like, you'll be like Joseph in prison, but running things. <laughs> you'll be a slave, but running things. I came to declare whatever level you are at, you will run things. Amen. You don't sound like you believe it. I said, I came to declare whatever level you are at, you will run things. Amen. That's what favor is. Favor is wherever you are, you excel.
That's what favor is. So favor is not an exemption. It's a different experience. That we go through the same thing, but experience it differently. That while there may be darkness in one place, there is light in Goshen. It's a different experience. Okay? And, and, and I want you to understand this because many of us miss God because we're looking about at how things are working. Write this down. God allows things to stop working so that he can work for us. He allows things to stop working so that he can get to work. He allows things. Right? God allows a storm so that he can rebuke it. Are you understanding? He, he allows your money to act funny. Yes, yes, yes. When you were unsaved, money flowed to you. You had too much money. You were the provider. Then God had to close those wells and allow a famine so that you understand what a hundredfold blessing in a famine is like. Yeah, some of you are experiencing a famine. It is not accidental. <laughs> it is not God, because you still think, I just need to hustle. I just need to push. I just need to, mm, and then I will do this. And God says, I'll keep doing it. You will strive. Keep working. As long as you work, he can't work. As long as you work, he can't work. So God allows things to stop working so that he can work for us. The biggest problem, and I'm going to be real, the biggest problem in faith is your ability to reconcile, are you hearing me, between what you hear and what you see. That's the biggest challenge that you're going to hear, right? Samuel gives Saul a word. Saul expects that when I do this, wakamba. Everyone will just be like, so, 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 right? Right? He, he was expecting everyone to walk towards him and cheer for him. Unfortunately, when he did that, everyone walked away. He, he thought that when he positioned himself for where God needed him to be, right, that everyone would be with him. But instead, people began to walk away from him. Can I talk to you? Sometimes some people leave, not because you've done anything. But it's time for them to go. Stop chasing them. Leave them. They need to go. I've learned. I used to think that as a pastor, when people left, I've done something wrong. I used to think that. Until I read the story of Gideon. He had thousands. Next, he was down to 300. God allowed people to leave. See, here's the challenge. Many of us, our response is based on mechanics and expectations. It's like, kind of like the first time you gave a seed. When you first gave a seed, someone miraculously came from nowhere bah, 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 and gave you exactly exactly look at your neighbor and say hand it over <laughs> gave you exactly what you had given right and more the overflow so you're like yeah 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 it works so you were like ah uh -uh. one more time let me do it again then you gave you even gave a bigger amount thinking it's the lotto and then time after time so this is what happened you see Samuel told Saul to chill and he thought that Saul was going to come quickly but the Bible says Saul took longer Samuel took longer than Saul expected so Samuel was like what he waited Saul was like this dude ain't coming so it's like, if he's not going to show up, I'm going to do it myself. Isn't that what we do when God doesn't seem to show up? 
you decide, I'm going to do it myself. And you take charge of your destiny. You see, many of us are worshiping God, but we're in charge of our destiny. Many of us are lifting holy hands, but we're in charge of our destiny. And although we are praying, we are giving God orders instead of listening to his orders. I'm preaching. I, I, I got some things I need to get off my chest today. And, and so you see the typical story in the story of, of, of Saul and Samuel. When Samuel takes long, Saul begins to look and sees people leaving. And he begins to panic. I was like, oh, snap. My army is leaving. What is an army? My security. My finances. My friendships. My identity. My esteem is disappearing. Maybe you're in a place right now where it seems like people don't respect you like the way they used to. Maybe people don't look at you the same. So you're, you're rushing to recover and restore that. You've taken control. And because we expected proof. We expected that when God speaks, the proof will be seen. For everyone to see that I serve a very big go-do. He's always by my side, right? And so when we expect God to be by our side, we expect things to work out in our favor. And for me, that's the challenge of the faith of today. That when we experience trials, we want to leave. When we experience trouble, we want to get out. So we take control and try to get out. We try. Because we see things walking away. Can I ask you today, what needs to walk away from your life? What do you, what do you need to walk away from today? It could be friendships that you need to walk away from. It could be businesses that you need to walk away from. It could be things that you thought were you that God is saying that isn't you that you need to walk away from. But instead, we take charge of our own destiny, right? And here's what the issue is. Saul was so focused on people leaving, right? And I want to say it this way. Whatever you focus on, you will fear. And whatever you fear, you will follow. Whatever you focus on, you will fear, and whatever you fear, you will follow. So because Saul's eyes were on the people, he feared them. And when they left, guess what he tried to do? He tried to follow. And he missed God because he was following people. Contrary to David. David is at a place where everyone abandons him. And the Bible says that in a time of distress, I think it's Psalm 34, where, where David says, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall forever be on my lips. That psalm is written, if you look at the heading, it says, in a time where David was hiding in a cave, pretending to be mad. David was isolated, and he filled the silence with his faith. When he was alone, he began to declare, I will bless the Lord at all times. Come on now, somebody needs to get this. Somebody needs to get this. Because many of us are allowing our thoughts to run our lives. You need to fill that awkward silence with faith. You need to begin to declare, I will bless the Lord at all times. Beloved, the most important thing you can have is the presence of God. Look at this. When people are walking away from Saul, the Bible says at that very moment, Samuel is walking towards Saul. Could it be that at the same time you think you're losing everything, God is coming towards you and wants to give you everything? But you can't see it because your eyes are on the people instead of his presence. Can I preach today? 
Your eyes are on the people instead of his presence. Look at what happens when we look for proof. Look at what happens in the story of Moses. The Bible says that Moses says, who should I say has sent me? And he, what he was saying is, I need proof. I need proof proof to show that I am sent. Many of us are always looking for proof. God prove that you've called me. God prove that I'm going to be rich. God prove that I'm going to accelerate. God prove that yes you told me I'll get married. God prove it. God prove that I'll have a business. God prove that I will start my own company. God prove that I'll start a ministry. God prove that I will go in this direction. God prove that I am the head and not the tail. God prove that I am called. God prove that I am above only and beneath. But look at what he answered says Moses. He says, tell them that I am has sent you. What he's simply saying is you don't need proof. All you need is my presence. All you need is my presence. My presence is proof enough that you are called by God. I came to declare over your life that you don't need proof. All you need is the presence. All you need is his presence. You don't need money. You just need to say, I am that I am has sent me. You don't need to wait for your spouse just still to know that I am that I am has sent me you don't need to wait for that business just know that I am that I am has sent me if God has sent you he will fulfill his assignment he will fund your business he will fund your ministry he will take care of your home he will take care of your business oh I wish I had a believer in this place Mount Zion it's time for us to realize that we need to stop chasing people and chase the presence of God Stop looking for proof. Stop playing, please. Stop looking for proof. Why? This is important. If you look for proof, you might miss his presence. Look at what happens. People are walking away from Saul. And at the very same time, Samuel is walking towards him. At the very same time, the Bible says the disciples were in a storm about to drown. And at the very same time, God, Jesus was walking on water towards them. Can I declare over your life today? The end will not be that people will walk away from you. That won't be the end. The end, you see, this is the problem. Saul went through exactly the same thing that David went through. Abandonment. But David's response was worship. I will bless the Lord. And guess what happens? It reached a point that Saul died somewhere that David was not even involved. And people came to look for the, the people who walked away from David. Can I preach today? Are the same people who came to look for him to crown him to be king. Your end will not be that people have left you. Your end will not be that you are broke. Your end will not be that you are not married. Your end will not be that you will not succeed. Your end will not be that you will not have a spiritual gift. Your end will not be that you are not called. Mount Zion, the end shall not be that we are just the way we are. The end shall not be where we are right now. I came to let you know at this very moment, the presence of God is getting closer to you than you think. At this very moment, the presence of God is moving towards you in your despair. He's saying, hand it over. Let it go. Let me come and work it. Let me come and offer the sacrifice. The Bible says Jesus has already paid the sacrifice. He says by the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we have been cleansed. We have been perfected once and for all. Meaning that Jesus has done everything that needs to be done so that you can succeed. Jesus has done everything that needs to be done so that you can excel. Jesus has done everything. Stop looking for proof. Start looking for his presence. Maybe you need to stop trying to prove yourself. And just start being present. That's a word for somebody. Maybe some of you need to stop hustling so hard and just stay home. Maybe the people need your presence.
Jesus Muda de um raciocínio I've been to many funerals eh? And one thing I always hear at funerals People just say I'm so glad you came People value your presence More than your contribution The Bible says Blessed are they that mourn For they shall be comforted It doesn't say they'll be contributed favorable to serve God. It's never favorable. Never. Never conducive. Never. And for many of us, God is like, I want you here. But you're so busy trying out there. That you can't work for me here. What he's saying is, do your thing here. Watch me work out. me change your children. Do your thing here. Watch me change your spouse. Do your thing here. Watch me change your family. Watch me change your work. People here will tell you, I've seen people come to this church with beef and wick. Hell. Hell. And I've told them, don't stop serving. And it was their service that changed their environment, not. Beloved, Saul used to wait on God to change his life. Where have you changed your response? You used to pray. What happened? You used to love service. What happened? You used to love fellowship. What happened? response has changed and the outcome has changed. God is saying, hand it over. Father, we want to thank you. Glorify him.